So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Michael Hosomo. He trained at Harvard and Oxford and is now a professor in the Department of Psychology at Boston University, a member of the Center for Memory and Brain, and recently finished a five-year stint as co-director of the NSF Science of Learning Center. His laboratory embodies the ideal of producing both excellent neuroscience and high-quality computational models, both of which are focused also on understanding how the hippocampus functions. This blend is re reflected in his brand new book, which is called How We Remember, Brain Mechanisms of Episodic Memory from MIT Press, just released this fall, right? Yeah. Uh, the book presents an incredible integration of behavioral characterizations of uh, episodic memory, along with a detailed computational model of the underlying neural dynamics. In other words, mathematics, neuroscience, and psychology brought to bear on the central problem of how memory works. Today, we will get a glimpse of some of this work. It gives me great pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Hanselmo. Well, thanks for that very, very nice introduction. Um, and thanks for the invitation to participate here. And thanks also for putting me after Yuri Bujaki, because I can't think of a better you know, introduction to the, the whole field and comprehensive overview of the field. So it's marvelous that you have that. And I, what I can talk about will be, as he mentioned, focusing on the entorhinal cortex and the models of grid cells, both the mechanisms of grid cells and their role in memory function. So I want to emphasize, as Chris mentioned, that I have people working on a number of different levels in my lab. I do have computational modeling going on. I'll, I'll pr present some of the work that Murat Erdem and Eric Zilli have done in my lab. But then we also are doing unit recording, similar to what Yuri Bujaki has been doing for many, many decades. Um, so I'll present work done by Mark Brandon. Um, and we also do whole cell patch recording and slice preparations of entorhinal cortex. I'll talk work talk about work done by uh, Lisa Giacomo in particular, as well as Chris Shea. So probably all of you have heard of patient HM, um, but I'm you know, assuming a very diverse background, so I want to give you a little bit of uh, overview of that. So patient HM was a man who had bilateral removal of the medial temporal lobes in treatment of epilepsy. He had seizures started in, starting in these regions, and so they did this removal of these areas on both sides, um, removing essentially the anterior portion of the hippocampus. This shows in a normal subject of the same age, uh, these structures in an MR. Um, he, hip, patient HM had the hippocampus removed as well as the entire entorhinal cortex and the perirhinal cortex and some other cortical regions. And this had this very profound effect on his ability to form new memories. Um, it's referred to commonly as anterograde amnesia, but very to be more specific, it's an impairment in the ability to encode new episodic memories. So he could not remember new events after the surgery that, you know, new events. He couldn't remember the time or location of meeting people. He worked with Sue Corkin for many years being tested for this memory deficit. And he never learned her name. At one point, somebody asked, well, you know, do you know who this woman is? And he, he said he didn't. He'd known her for 20, 30 years at the time. Um, they said, you know, he sort of looked at her and he sort of had a vague feeling of familiarity. He said, well, maybe went to, we went to high school together. Um, so, so he really has no ability to form new episodic memories. So I've been very interested in the brain mechanisms going on in these regions that would mediate the episodic memory. So Chris already mentioned the book. Um, this is just showing the cover of the book where I actually lay out how the physiological data on some of these structures could be involved in encoding and retrieving episodic memories as spatiotemporal trajectories. And this just gives a, a kind of a quick overview of a, an example of an of individual episodic memory for my arriving at work in the morning. Um, this is where I parked the car, and then I would walk down the street and come into my office, maybe talk to somebody there, maybe go back down, go to another office in biomedical engineering, come back. There's various events occurring at particular times and locations in that sequence, in that particular episodic memory. If I were patient HM, I wouldn't remember any of those components. And talking about it as spatiotemporal trajectory, in addition to being able to remember the location of particular events, I can remember the time at which these particular events occurred. So when I come down into my office, I might actually talk you know, first to my, my wife, whose office is right next door, then maybe to a grad student. It's in the same location, but I can distinguish between those events in time as well. 
So these are the essential features of episodic memory. And they seem they are somehow being mediated by these circuits within the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus. So here is just showing the, the circuits in the human. And what I, as Yuri has already introduced, what we're focusing on is understanding these analogous circuits in the rat, um, in particular trying to understand how it is that the uh, behavioral role of these areas that's been shown by the impairments caused by lesions are related to the network mechanisms there, phenomena such as grid cells and play cells, as well as head direction cells, and in, the in relating it to the slice physiology, understanding how it relates to the oscillatory dynamics and resonance properties of individual neurons within these regions. So this is an overview of what I'll talk about. First, I'll talk about grid cells as a code for spatial location. Then I'll talk about oscillations as a mechanism for grid cells, um, and including some experimental data supporting this relationship of oscillations to grid cells. And then finally, I'll talk about how we can model how grid cells might be involved in goal-directed behavior, memory-guided goal-directed behavior. So first, I'll talk about the grid cell code. So this shows a uh, standard experiment used to study grid cells in the entorhinal cortex. So this is using the same sorts of recording techniques that Yuri has already been talking about. This shows the electrode tracks going down from an implant going down into the dorsal entorhinal cortex. This shows the task that we use, which is a rat running around and foraging in an open field environment. Um, so I'm massively speeding this up, but this is the actual trajectory of a rat running around in an open field environment, chasing after little bits of crushed up cereal, chocolate cereal that we toss into the environment, primarily to give the animal motivation to explore the environment uh, extensively, give good coverage. And you can see if you look at the, um, the, this is actually an animated rat, but it's actual data, the trajectory is the actual data, and the red dots show the location of the rat when a single grid cell fires a spike. And you can see that the spiking starts out right away falling in uh, various locations in the environment. And as the rat runs around foraging more and more, obviously it never attains that speed during foraging. But if it runs around, you can see that eventually you can see these firing fields where the cell is firing consistently in the environment. This shows another cell showing a similar pattern of regular firing fields in the environment. And because they're following in this regular pattern, these are referred to as grid cells. Sometimes it's described as a hexagonal pattern. Sometimes they're just described as falling on the vertices of tightly packed equilateral triangles. It was the Moser lab that originally discovered grid cells. And part of the reason that they seem to have been the first to discover this was that um, they were uh, particularly looking in the dorsal regions of the medial entorhinal cortex, which are the regions that send the input to the dorsal hippocampus where most recordings of play cells have been done. And Yuri already talked extensively about play cells. This is just an example of a play cell recorded in the hippocampus. Um, and it's been shown by various models that the patterns of grid cell firing could drive the play cell firing within the hippocampus. So right at the end, during the talks, Yuri mentioned that there's differences in the scaling of the environment by different cells. And this is true not only for play cells, but also for grid cells. So it's been shown by the Moser lab that if they recorded up in the dorsal end of the medial entorhinal cortex, right near the post-rhinal, the border of the post-rhinal cortex, they would find cells with firing fields that are relatively close together in the environment. So these firing fields are in the order of about 40 centimeters apart. That's what's plotted here. And then when they recorded further ventral in the medial entorhinal cortex, they would find firing fields that were further apart in the environment. So here you can see the firing fields are about 80 centimeters apart. That's what's plotted here. And when they went even more ventral, they had a rat running back and forth along an 18 meter track. And this is actually a simulation of their data, but we, you can see firing fields in that data with uh, distances between the firing fields that get up to quite large distances, up to 10 meters. So this could be a potential mechanism for dealing with multiple spatial scales. It's in, important for 
um, describing a specific location in the environment, but it could also be important for different temporal scales of memory. For instance, my ability to remember, you know, the trajectory that I first walked into this room and, you know, put my briefcase down here and walked up to the other room. That would be one scale, but then I can also remember, you know, being at the hotel and being driven from the hotel to the parking lot and coming into this building on a different spatial scale. So this just shows an example. There's a number of different models that have addressed how grid cells could drive the activity of play cells. This is just an example that I had in a simulation where I had an uh, array of 75 simulated grid cells with three different spatial scales, the narrow spacing down to much broader spacing, as well as different spatial phases at each of these scales. So if you look closely, you can see that these firing fields are offset by uh, in the X or Y direction in the environment, which I refer to as spatial phases. You can choose arbitrary individual sets of grid cells, and if you look at where they overlap in their input, you can generate firing of neurons that looks like a place cell response. So here's a cell that's spiking only in a very localized region of the environment. Here's a different cell coding a different location. Here's another cell coding a different location. Obviously, some of these combinations of cells will give you multiple firing fields, and there's some evidence that some hippocampal neurons have multiple firing fields, but if, you're, if you have some selection process for picking out the smaller firing fields, you can actually get quite specific location information out of this grid cell code. All right, so that was kind of a quick overview of the grid cell code. Now I'm going to focus in on modeling related to the mechanism of generation of grid cells, which relates very strongly to what Yuri talked about in terms of phase coding of the environment. In fact, it's kind of a perfect fit. So there's a number of different models of grid cells. I want to kind of tell you that up front. Um, I'm going to tend to focus on the oscillatory interference model that was initially proposed by Neil Burgess and John O'Keefe and Caswell Berry. Um, so that'll be the main focus of what I'll talk about today. But I want to mention that there's also models of grid cells based on attractor dynamics, in including one by Chris Elias Smith that was kind of impressive because they actually modeled the phenomenon of grid cells before grid cells were named. It was based on the 2004 paper when the, the Moser lab hadn't even named them or referred to them as grid cells. So this model is actually able to simulate the characteristics of grid cells. So this is the oscillatory interference model. The output generates for a simulated rat running around in a simulated environment. You get these firing fields and you can get narrow spacing firing fields similar to the in vivo data or wide spacing similar to the in vivo data. And based on this model, Neil Burgess and John O'Keefe made a very specific prediction about the experimental data. They stated that they predicted that the increasing spatial scale of the grid-like firing as you move from the postrinal border of the medial entorhinal cortex would result from a gradually decreasing intrinsic frequency of the neurons. This is, I think, quite impressive, or I like to point this out because it's really relatively rare in neuroscience to have an explicit modeling prediction that then is tested and supported by the experimental data. Um, it's very much the tradition within physics, and I think neuroscience is really starting to to move in that direction now, which is very exciting. Because we went and tested this explicit prediction by looking at the intrinsic properties of some neurons in slice preparations of entorhinal cortex and essentially supported that prediction. So Lisa Giacomo did this work in my laboratory. What she did was to take slices at different dorsal to ventral positions within the medial entorhinal cortex. Um, this is this had not really been done very much in the entorhinal cortex before. There was a lot of slice physiology, but people usually didn't keep track of the actual anatomical position of the slices. So she just set it up so she had different chambers for keeping track of which were the dorsal, which were the ventral slices. And then she did recordings in layer two stellate cells. She had whole cell patch recordings in layer two stellate cells. This just shows a cell filled after the recording. And she would push them up near the firing threshold, where you can see it generates intermittent action potentials. That's what these lines are. And then in between the action potentials, we, she observed sub-threshold oscillations that had been previously described by a collaborator of mine named Angel Alonso, who is at, was at the Montreal Neurological Institute. Unfortunately, he died uh, in 2005. But these membrane potential oscillations that Angel Alonso had described have a frequency around theta rhythm. So this shows a cell with an oscillation of around 7 hertz in these membrane potential 
And we went and tested this prediction of the model and basically found data that supports that prediction. So when Lisa recorded from neurons in the ventral, or sorry, the dorsal end of medial anterior, she found neurons with higher frequency membrane potential oscillations around seven or eight hertz. And when she recorded in more ventral regions of medial anterior, she found neurons with lower frequency oscillations on average, um, around four hertz in these example neurons. Corresponding to that membrane potential oscillation frequency, they also have a resonance frequency, which can be measured by giving a chirp input. So starting out at low frequencies of oscillate, oscillating current injection and gradually increasing the frequency of this current injection, the neurons will show a resonance where they actually show their maximal amplitude of oscillation, oscillatory response at a particular frequency. In dorsal neurons, it's around seven or eight hertz. In ventral neurons, it's more around an average of about four hertz. So you have this corresponding difference in the resonance frequency. A number of different laboratories have replicated this. Other people in my lab have replicated it, but also Uwe Heinemann and Urcheva, as well as Matt Nolan's laboratories, have shown this same effect along the dorsal to ventral axis of the medial anterior cortex. And part of the reason that we could publish this data in science was because we had already this model that Neil Burgess had developed where we could plug in the in vitro data. We had higher frequencies in response to a velocity input plugged it into the model, and we got narrow spacing between the firing fields, similar to the dorsal recordings, and plug in lower frequency oscillations into the model, get wider spacing, more similar to the ventral medial anterior neurons. So it's a very effective model for linking these different levels. So I'm going to try to describe this model to you, since I'm the kind of on the computational theoretical neuroscience uh, component of the talks today. So I'm going to give you an overview of how these models will work. The basic idea is oscillatory interference, that you have a neuron at one, or an oscillation at one frequency, and then a different oscillation at another frequency. Um, and this could be implemented on a number of different levels, as I'll show you. It could be within a neuron, though the, the data suggests that's not the case. More likely, it's due to influences, interactions at the network level. But if you have oscillations with slightly different frequencies, you'll basically get a beat effect. If you've ever tuned an instrument, you've heard that. You know, I used to tune my clarinet with some tuner that put out a particular tone, and I'd have a slightly different tone, and so wah, 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 you'd hear that beat effect. And that's because one frequency is shifting in phase relative to the other. So whether in phase, you have constructive interference, you get, and then you could put a threshold on that and get spiking. Then it shifts gradually out of phase. When they're out of phase, you have destructive interference. You wouldn't have any spiking. Then as they come back in phase, you get constructive interference. You get spiking again. So that's the basic idea of oscillatory interference. But I hope right away you see a particular problem, that here it's an oscillation in time. But of course, the cells are responding in space. So how do we link this oscillation in time to, to space? Well. So, and this just shows an example of that problem. Here you have the rat, rat, rat running around randomly in the environment. It's obviously following a you know, simulated trajectory that's quite regular. But you can see if, it, if, the, if the spiking's coming at regular time intervals, it'll just fall at arbitrary locations. So the key additional feature of the model, um, and, and Yuri's talk kind of led into this nicely, is the incorporation of a velocity input to the model. Right? So the key feature of the model is that the frequency of one or a set of oscillations is being regulated by the velocity of the rat. All right? So velocity in, in physics has a component of translational speed as well as direction. Those are the components that are given to the model. So we have speed and head direction, or heading in the simulations, coming into the, the model. And this will regulate one frequency. So when it's going this direction, it's actually pushing it to a higher frequency. When it's coming back this way, it's pushing it to a lower frequency. And that causes the spiking to fall in regular spatial bands along one dimension in the environment. And this is a reasonable uh, physiological assumption because there's plenty of data that neurons do respond on the basis of direction and speed. All right, so there's cells called head direction cells that will respond based on the head direction of the rat in the environment. So this is a cell everywhere, it's sampled everywhere in the environment, and then the firing rate is plotted in polar coordinates for what direction the animal was heading. 
So this one's responding when the rat is facing at 10 degrees. So let's say that's 10 degrees. The cell would fire you know, when I'm facing this way and it wouldn't fire anywhere else. And then if I went over here and faced in that particular allosin, it's like a compass direction, it would fire for that direction and nowhere else. And then if I was over here, it wouldn't, it's not firing to a particular cue in the environment. It's again, it seems to be the compass direction in the environment. And that's what's just what you need for tracking position. So these head direction cells, here's a cell with this relatively narrow tuning for a preferred angle of 10 degrees and doesn't fire elsewhere. Here's another one that has a preferred angle of about 200 degrees. In addition, there's neurons that respond on the basis of running speed. These were initially discovered in the O'Keefe lab, but we've recorded a lot of these cells where they'll, they'll change systematically based on the running speed of the rat. And uh, Yuri mentioned this as well. So there's good evidence for neural representation of the components of velocity. And if you combine these inputs into these cells in the medial entorhinal cortex, then you could imagine that they would drive uh, perhaps intrinsic oscillations to different frequencies dependent upon this representation of velocity. Now the neuron that I earlier showed that had a tuning of a head direction cell for angle zero would therefore have constructive interference bands in the environment laid out per per perpendicular to that zero angle. If you had a different input of a different head direction cell with the angle of preference of 120, that is to the northwest, then you'd get these constructive interference bands. And if you had another head direction cell with an angle preference of 240, you get these constructive interference bands. And then you could sum these together or have a multiplicative interaction, and you'll get this generation of these firing fields that look like a grid cell with the same hexagonal layout or you know, tightly packed equilateral triangles. So this is the essence of the oscillatory interference model. And this just shows how it works. So I showed you earlier the data um, with a, you know, the actual trajectory of a rat. Here's the same actual trajectory of a rat from our lab being plugged into the model and generating spiking activity in the model. And as we speed up the trajectory, you can see that the model will generate regular firing fields in the environment that look very similar to the regular firing fields in the environment that are generated in the data. Now this third movie is going to show the actual oscillations being updated by the velocity representation by these three different head directions. So you can see there's three different head direction inputs pushing things in different directions based on the current heading of the animal. And when they're in phase with each other, you get spikes. When they're out of phase with each other, you don't get spikes. But you can see as these oscillations interact over time, they're generating this pattern of firing that corresponds to the grid cells. So this is what was used in the um, linking of the in vitro data to the in vivo data. Now, I want to mention that how it works in terms of the oscillation frequency. We have this higher frequency in dorsal versus ventral. Um, how does that result in the spacing? Um, this just shows an example. Imagine that you have a simulated rat starting out in the firing field of one uh, grid cell, and then it moves at a constant velocity into this location. Um, and so that's what I'm representing on the top is a constant velocity, and it's shifting one of these frequencies in a constant manner. And because of that, because it's slightly higher frequency, its phase shown in blue will shift relative to the phase shown of a baseline oscillation shown in red. And if you sum them together, you'll get constructive interference that transitions to destructive interference. But now if you want to have a different spacing between the firing fields, all you need to do is, well, so this is, we'll consider this a ventral cell with a small frequency change. We'll, we can then have a dorsal cell with a larger frequency change. So we're going from ventral to dorsal, ventral to dorsal, with a larger frequency change that is a higher frequency response to a velocity input. We have a faster shift in phase. The blue shifts more rapidly relative to the red, and you get a faster transition from constructive interference to destructive to constructive interference, and therefore, for the same movement, you have firing fields that are closer to each other in the environment. And Yuri showed beautiful data showing that the cells, the phase of the cells relative to each other code distance. And that's exactly what this model does. You can determine the location from the relative phase of these cells. So this relative phase between these, the, between these two oscillations, 
exactly corresponds to the location in the environment. So you can essentially, what's happening is because frequency is changing with velocity, phase is integrating that velocity and phase depends upon distance or location in the environment. So, and Yuri has beautiful data supporting that aspect of the model. <clears throat> All right, so I, I don't want to claim that this is the end of the story. Um, it isn't. There's people out there that will argue still against the oscillatory interference model, so it's still an open question. Um, there's, particularly, there's issues for a single cell implementation of the oscillatory interference model, which I had originally modeled when using the, the Burgess model. One problem is the oscillations in single neurons will synchronize, and we found that when we tried to simulate it, and this was shown by Remy Lengel and Gutkin. Another problem is that there's a variance in the oscillations. You saw the oscillations could be quite noisy. That will distort the grid cell firing. And we actually tested to, to a requirement of the model, which is that there should be a linear shift in oscillation frequency in the individual cells as you depolarize them, with the assumption that velocity input is depolarizing the cell. Well, what we found was that the neurons tended to have kind of a broad band um, noisy oscillation initially, and then they would go into this more narrow band oscillation at a particular frequency. So they didn't have the linear relationship that we needed. Interestingly enough, we found they do have a linear relationship of resonance with membrane potential. So it might be that the resonance is being regulated, but not these subthreshold oscillations. Any, in any case, this has tended to push the oscillatory interference models toward network solutions. Um, with Eric Zilli, we modeled uh, populations of spiking neurons. Uh, Tad Blair's developed a model using a ring attractor. I've also worked on models using persistent spiking, which is another uh, intracellular phenomenon that I don't have time to, to go into detail. I'm going to talk first about this, mo this uh, model done by Eric Zilli in my lab. The basic idea of this model was, number one, to not do it in a single cell, since the oscillations were synchronized, so we had different populations of neurons. And the other was to get over the problem of variance. The neurons have quite wide variance in their oscillations and their spike times. So Eric used what are called velocity-controlled oscillators, that are oscillators shifted by velocity, that had noisy spike times. So here you can see these spike times are coming at relatively irregular intervals, even though it's a constant input. But if you look across this whole population of neurons with this characteristic, the interspike interval at the population level is actually very regular because these neurons are interconnected, even though the individual cells in that population have relatively wide variance, more like the physiological data. So this is a way of both overcoming the problem of, cells, of oscillation synchronizing in single cells and the problem of the variance of the spike times. And he also implemented it so that he would have a linear relationship of frequency with velocity. So he could plug these, he, using these populations of neurons as the velocity controlled oscillators, he could combine them and have them shift from being in phase to drive spiking to being out of phase without spiking and generate for a trajectory, generate the regular pattern of grid cell firing that you would see. So that's a, addressing some of the issues to do with the oscillatory interference model. So another set of data supporting the, I'm going to kind of run through a lot of data supporting the oscillatory interference model of grid cells. Um, one of these is that we showed that there's a loss of grid cell firing patterns with a loss of theta rhythm oscillations at the network level. So theta rhythm oscillations have been studied for many years. Um, it's been shown, um, in particular, uh, Vanderwolf was one of the people at Western Ontario who Yuri worked with who did a lot of the work on the mechanisms of um, theta rhythm and the uh, correlation with behavior. So there's a classic uh, review that I cite quite a bit by Bujaki, Leung, and Vanderwolf from 1982. Um, what they showed was that these large amplitude theta rhythm oscillations in the hippocampus, this is actually just showing a recording of theta from stratum lacunosa moleculare and CA1, they tend to appear more when animals are running around or orienting, they're less prominent during when animals are performing uh, consumatory activities such as grooming, eating, or drinking. And there's a number of studies showing a correlation between theta rhythm oscillations and learning and memory. Um, and it's been shown uh, that the medial septum is involved in driving theta rhythm oscillations. 
Um, so a, a number of different researchers, including Yuri Bujaki as well as uh, Steve Fox, have focused on how rhythmic activity in the medial septum could drive the theta rhythm oscillations. In particular, GABAergic neurons can, draw, can cause GABAergic inhibition of interneurons in the hippocampus and thereby cause rhythmic disinhibition of pyramidal cells. What we wanted to do was to test the role of theta rhythm in the, um, both the hippocampus and the anterior cortex. And so what Mark Brandon did in my laboratory was to infuse Musimol into the medial septum which essentially would shut down the neural activity within the medial <coughs> septum and thereby block theta rhythm oscillations in the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex. And this medial sept, so this is just showing the medial septal inactivation. In the control conditions before infusion, you can see there's a, quite a prominent band in the power spectra right around seven or eight hertz. Then after medial septum inactivation, you have a loss of this oscillation frequency um, in the entorhinal cortex. And this shows what happens to the grid cells. So here's the oscillations on top. In the baseline, you have quite prominent theta rhythm oscillations. During the medial septum inactivation, you get a loss of these oscillations, and then they recover over time after the inactivation. And you can see here there's quite clear uh, spatial periodicity in the environment for this individual grid cell. During the medial septum inactivation, you have a loss of this spatial periodicity, which then recovers as the theta rhythm oscillations recover. This shows a different grid cell with a different spacing. Again, you can see the regular firing in the environment in the control baseline conditions. This firing is lost during the medial septum inactivation and then recovers as the theta rhythm oscillations recover. There's a bit of a difference in firing rate here between the inactivation and the starting condition, so we actually, in a lot of cases, subsampled the neurons to see what the pattern of firing looked like, and you can see even when it's subsampled for the same mean firing rate, you have the same spatial periodicity that's present during the control baseline conditions that is not present during the inactivation. There was another nice sort of intrinsic control for this work, which is that many of the grid cells in deeper layers of the entorhinal cortex, the Moser lab had shown that they were conjunctive cells. They respond both with spatial periodicity like grid cells, and they respond on the basis of head direction. So here's an, oh, oh yeah, so this is just showing actually that you have the uh, uh, same change with the firing rate plots going from periodicity to absence of periodicity. Um, and this is showing that if you measure the gridness score of these individual neurons, then when you actually do the, the mucimol infusion, you'll have a reduction in the theta power and you'll have a corresponding reduction in the gridness score for these individual neurons, which then recovers at the time that the theta rhythm oscillations recover. So here's the conjunctive cells I wanted to talk about. So the conjunctive cells are cells that will respond with spatial periodicity in the environment as well as responding to a particular head direction. These cells during the medial septum inactivation will lose their spatial periodicity, so you can see it's firing everywhere in the environment, but it doesn't lose its sensitivity to head direction. So it maintains its head direction sensitivity um, even though the spatial periodicity is lost and then the spatial periodicity recovers as the theta rhythm oscillations recover. So this shows that it's not just wiping out all the coding by the cells in the environment. They're still maintaining a response based on head direction. They're just not coding the spatial, the spatial location with the same spatial periodicity. And here's other examples where it's nicely spatially periodic, periodic before and has head direction selectivity. Then it becomes less spatially periodic, periodic but it maintains its head direction selectivity. Um, and here's another neuron that's, uh, these are neurons, four examples of neurons that are pure head direction cells. So these are cells that will respond throughout the environment, but with very, in this case, quite narrow tuning for head direction. And, and again, the medial septum inactivation does not change the head direction tuning, even though these cells are not tuned for spatial location at all. And so the, the head direction tuning is maintained during the medial septum inactivation. So it's, this is another piece of data that supports the idea that the, the gridness code 
is being created somehow by the interaction of oscillations in the entorhinal cortex. So there's a head direction input coming into the system driving these cells, but then the oscillations regulated by the medial septum are important for generating the, the, the gridness score, um, this spatial periodicity that the gridness score measures, which is dropped very clearly when the theta rhythm oscillations are reduced during, medial, uh, during mucimol infusions. There's a nice correlation with behavior here in the sense that James Krobach had shown that mucimol infusions into the medial septum ca cause a behavioral impairment on spatial memory. So it's been shown in, you probably know the Morris water maze, this is a task where a rat is placed into a large tank and swims around until it finds a a platform that's submerged just under the surface of this opaque water. So the rat can't see it when it's actually swimming around, but it wants to get to this platform so it can get out of the water. On the first trial, the rat will swim around extensively until it finds the platform. On later trials, it'll go straight to the platform location. And even if you move the platform day to day, it can learn the new location on each individual day. But lesions of entorhinal cortex or hippocampus will impair this performance, and in addition, medial septum inactivation by mucimol will also cause an impairment where it doesn't go as rapidly to the location of that platform. Consistent with the idea that the mucimol infusions are impairing spatial representations by wiping out this spatial periodicity. All right, so that shows another piece of evidence supporting the idea that oscillations are important for grid cells. I just want to mention some really recent data from Mark Brandon's work um, which shows another potential role of oscillations in grid cells, and this has to do with theta cycle skipping. So he found that mucimol also influences what we, what's referred to as theta cycle skipping. This is something that had been observed, and you can actually find it if you look back through older experiments um, in a number of different laboratories. Theta cycle skipping refers to the fact that if you do an autocorelogram, you'll see peaks at the theta interval of about 125 milliseconds, but you'll sometimes see larger peaks at the interval of two theta oscillations, 250 milliseconds. And that's what we refer to as cycle skipping because it means the cells are pr predominantly jumping on, or spiking on alternate theta cycles. Now you'll see some cases where you totally lose theta rhythmicity during the mucimol infusions and then get the cycle skipping back. But you'll see other cases where you'll have cycle skipping before the infusion and then you'll go to a case where the cycle skipping is gone even though there's still theta rhythmicity left. This was an intriguing effect that we looked more closely at theta cycle skipping and we looked at pairs of cells that showed theta cycle skipping and found that they have in their cross correlations some pairs of cells will fire on the same cycle each time. So here's an example of a group of four cells. They're all firing on the same theta cycle. So this white is one theta cycle, gray is another theta cycle, white is, white is another theta cycle. These are all firing at the end of this theta cycle, then they skip a theta cycle, then they fire at the end of this theta cycle. Here's another example where they're firing at the beginning of the, the white theta cycle, then they skip a cycle, then they fire at the beginning of a cycle, skip a cycle, fire at the beginning of a cycle. This results in a uh, cross correlation that peaks right at zero and doesn't have as much at one theta as it does at the second theta. But then there's other cells that are anti-synchronous, where th here's a cell that fires at the beginning of this gray theta cycle, then yellow and green fire at the beginning of the white cycle, then you go back to blue, then yellow, then blue, then yellow, blue, yellow and green, blue, yellow and green. And this shows up as a cross-correlation where there's no synchronous firing, but they're firing at an interval of one theta cycle apart from each other. We are very intrigued by this because, as I mentioned, this sort of thing appears in other data, including in, in Yuri Bujaki's data. So it might be that this is involved in driving the, the cell assembly activity that Yuri saw. So in a paper in Nature in 2003, he described these cell assemblies firing in the hippocampus. And if you look at it, you'll see that these cell assemblies are actually firing on alternating cycles of the theta rhythm oscillation. And here's a different cell assembly firing at an interval of one theta rhythm. So it might be that the theta cycle skipping is a component of separation of cell assemblies within the hippocampus based on this entorhinal input. All right, so now I'm going to go on and talk about some um, other characteristics of experimental data on the oscillatory interference model. 
Um, I have a long list here, but I'm not going to run through all of these things. I don't have nearly enough time to do it. I just want to kind of emphasize how it relates to a wide range of different data. I've already mentioned the, the dorsal to ventral difference that was predicted by the model. Um, I also want to mention theta phase precession. Um, the model can generate theta phase precession in simulations of grid cells. Luckily, Yuri spent a lot of time talking about theta phase precession because I find it's very hard. It really takes like 20 minutes to explain theta phase precession. Um, but the model is able to generate that. So here's an example similar to what Yuri showed, but this is for a enterhinal grid cell as a rat runs along a linear track. Um, and you can see that it's at, for each firing field, it starts out firing at late phases and moves to earlier phases. We've also analyzed our data to look for theta phase precession in running in a two-dimensional open field environment. Uh, and the model is able to generate phase precession. So these oscillatory interference models will show spikes firing late as the cell enters the fire, or the rat enters the firing field and then shifting to earlier and earlier phases for each of the firing fields of the grid cell. Um, there's also an interesting correlation of the resonance properties of the neurons with the location, the anatomical location of grid cells. Uh, so if you look at where resonance appears, when you record from stellate cells in the medial enterhinal cortex, as I mentioned earlier, you can give this chirp input and you'll see neurons resonating around six to eight hertz. Um, and this has been shown in a number of different studies. This is data by Chris Shea in my lab. But if you go into the adjacent lateral enterhinal cortex and record in layer two, those neurons don't show resonance, so they'll respond to a chirp with this sort of response. They'll start out high and go down low. So the resonance properties seem to be very specific to medial enterhinal cortex, and so is the grid cell characteristic. So here's grid cells recorded in the medial enterhinal cortex. When people have looked in lateral enterhinal cortex, including Jim Kinnearum's lab, they don't see the grid cell periodicity in the lateral enterhinal neurons. So it seems as if that resonance is somehow linked to the characteristics of the grid cells. A final connection that I want to mention is that there, the model predicts a link between a cellular current known as the H current. This is the current that underlies the resonance properties of the neurons. Um, and it predicts that that should be related to the grid cell spacing. So the idea is that the membrane potential oscillations and the resonance both are properties of the H current. Now the H current is a short version of the hyperpolarization activated cation current. This is a current that is activated when the neuron is hyperpolarized and then it depolarizes the cell. So here is a simulation done with Eric von Sand where when the cell is hyperpolarized it turns on the H current that depolarizes the cell, that turns off the H current so it hyperpolarizes the cell, that turns it on again and so on in this oscillatory dynamic that actually appears as an oscillation because the H current response is delayed relative to the hyperpolarization. So if you do a voltage clamp or you step down to a hyperpolarized level, then you can see how quickly the H current turns on. And in dorsal cells, it'll turn on relatively quickly with a fast time constant. In ventral cells, it'll turn on more slowly with a slower time constant. And if you plug these into biophysical simulations, the fast time constant will give you faster oscillations higher frequency resonance as well. The slow time constants will give you slower frequencies and lower frequency resonance properties. Now the, res the um, time constant has been related to expression of a subunit of the H current, the HCN1 subunit. So this shows um, molecular data, shows that, my battery must be running out. Okay, there's the molecular data showing that if you express just the HCN1 subunit of the H current, you'll get relatively fast time constants. If you express just the HCN2 subunit, you'll get slow time constants. And if you express a mixture of HCN1 and HCN2, you'll get intermediate time constants. So this suggests that that could be a molecular mechanism for this dorsal to ventral difference in the time constants and therefore the resonance of the, the cells and based on the model could be a difference, could underlie the difference in spacing. So my student Lisa Giacomo had found this dorsal to ventral difference, went to the Moser lab where she could work with mice that were forebrain restricted HCN1 knockout mice. And what she did was to look at the spacing in control mice 
at different dorsal to ventral positions and compare it with the spacing between grid cell firing fields in knockout mice at the corresponding dorsal to ventral positions. And what she found was a systematic shift to wider spacing. So this HCN1 knockout, which would cause a slower time constant, does seem to create a wider spacing between the firing fields of the grid cell, supporting this idea of the link between the resonance properties of the neurons and the spacing of the firing fields. All right, I wanted to, again, briefly mention other types of models of grid cells. Um, as I mentioned before, there are attractor dynamic models of grid cells. These attractor dynamic models don't depend as much on oscillations. In fact, the initial ones had no oscillations in them, though actually Chris did stick oscillations into his model. But for instance, Barack and Feet don't have oscillations. What they get their grid, gridness pattern from is the pattern of interaction. So if they lay out the cells at, based on where the cells are encoding in the environment, these cells aren't, there's no topography in the entorhinal cortex, but if you, you know, lay it out as if the cells were positioned relative to where they were coding in the environment, then you would have a excitatory interaction for cells coding near, nearby locations and an inhibitory interaction for cells coding more distant locations. And this results in a population activity that has this hexagonal pattern based on the um, interaction of a group of cells with circularly symmetric connectivity. And then you can move the pattern activity around by having different input from conjunctive cells coding different directions. And I recently combined these attractor dynamics with oscillations, and I'm just showing you an example from these simulations where this just shows how the population will settle into an attractor dynamic state. So you can see that it starts out with random activity initially, and then because of these circularly symmetric interactions, the cells will fire with this hexagonal pattern eventually. They'll kind of shift their position so that you get the um, firing fields fitting to a generally circular pattern of interaction. And you can move the activity around by then biasing the, I did it by biasing the oscillation amplitude in a particular direction. But there's certain advantages to these attractor dynamic models. One is that because they have attractor dynamics within a population, they're less sensitive to noise. Um, they also have the characteristic that they can account for why you seem to have a relatively even distribution of spatial phases of grid cells. Um, they account for the fact that there's a shared orientation of the grid cells. They'll tend to have their firing fields line up. All the cells in the enter in a particular region will line up with the same orientation in the environment. Um, and they also avoid the one assumption that you maybe have noticed of the oscillatory interference model, which is that it required the head direction inputs to be at 60 or 120 degree intervals. The uh, tractor dynamics models do not require that. All right, so in the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about, now we've talked about the mechanism of grid cells quite a bit. Now I'm going to talk about how grid cells could be used as a mechanism of guiding behavior on the basis of spatial memory. So this relates back to the Morris water maze. Um, surprisingly, the Morris water maze is actually a little bit harder to simulate than some other behavioral tasks. Um, the, and the, the reason for this is that you know, behavioral tasks where the rat is running on a linear track, you have the animals only coding a relatively small number of locations, whereas in the Morris water maze, it has a very broad range of locations that it could go to and it doesn't visit all of those before it's able to decide on a particular trajectory to a particular location. So the question is, well, how do you simulate that? Well, what we did was to use the grid cell representation to allow the animal to essentially uh, sample different forward trajectories through the environment. So imagine you have a rat with just a relatively sparse coating by play cells in the environment. And then it sends out forward trajectories in a, a variety of different possible directions. And when it has one trajectory that overlaps with a goal location, then it selects that trajectory. So it samples this wide range of different trajectories. And when it finds the trajectory that activates a play cell near a previously learned goal location, then it can select that trajectory and choose to go in that direction. 
So this is advantageous over previous models where you had to have the rat create play cells at every location in the environment so that you could diffuse activity back from the goal and choose your, your direction of movement. So this is how we did this in this model. This is work done by Murat Erdem in my lab. We would assume a particular um, heading, you know, at any given point in time, the animal could actually turn its head in that direction and think about the trajectory, or it could just be imagining that direction. But the idea is that it has a particular head direction representation with different levels of activity of different head direction cells that are held constant. And then this drives grid cells with different spatial coding. Here we're assuming actually a continuum of different spatial coding, but as Yuri mentioned, there's actually quantal coding for different uh, spacings, but that should work just as well. But you have this transition then of the firing fields um, in time going from firing to no firing to firing. And when they line up, you can drive individual play cells. So here we're driving one play cell, here we're driving a different play cell, a di different position on the trajectory. And in this way, the animal could then sample in the grid cell population, sample potential trajectories through the environment involving shifts in, in phase of the grid cells. It would do one trajectory, then sample another one, then sample another one. Um, and this just involves a process of the animal shifting um, based on the head direction input, shifting the frequency so that it would essentially code different patterns of movement through the, in, through the grid cell plane. And then when it finds the um, particular trajectory that overlaps uh, with the play cell at the goal location, then it will select that trajectory as the one that it heads towards. So we've done this in the Morris water maze. We've used this to simulate behavior in the Morris water maze. This is just showing um, kind of an example, particularly in cases where the platform location is being moved day to day, the animal can learn very rapidly just on one or two trials. So imagine the rat is swimming around, creating a, you know, just a few sparse place cells. We're illustrating how it, you know, it doesn't need very many place cells. But then if it finally finds the platform location, it codes a place cell at that platform location. And then when it's put back in the environment, it's put at a new location and it can just scan possible trajectories through the environment and just choose the trajectory that goes straight to that goal location based on the activation of the place cell near that goal location. So in this manner then, if you lose this anterior representation, you'll lose the ability to scan in the environment. And this would be consistent with the fact that lesions of the anterior cortex cause impairments, cause this difficulty in choosing a trajectory straight to the platform location. This was shown in this <coughs> paper by Stefanach et al. from the, the Moser Laboratory. So, so I've basically given you an overview of how this mechanism could work in the rat. I'm just going to briefly mention how it could relate back to the human, talking about some data on imaging of the hippocampus. This was work that I did in collaboration with my wife, Chantal Stern. Uh, who's also at Boston University with uh, her student, Thackeray Brown. Um, in this task, human subjects were guiding themselves through a pattern of hallways that had cues for individual hallways. And some hallways were just, some of these uh, hallways were just non-overlapping, but there were others where there was a combination of, of possible trajectories. So if you were starting out in this uh, hallway, shown by red with particular cues, then when you get through the end of the overlapping segments, you'd have to turn left. But if you started in this hallway shown by purple, at the end of the overlapping segments, you'd have to go straight. And what they found was that the hippocampus, there was greater <coughs> hippocampal activation in the overlapping condition than in the non-overlapping condition, consistent with the fact that the subjects reported they were doing this task by when they were in the first hallway, they were thinking, oh, okay, I'm gonna go down these, this overlapping segment and I'm gonna turn left. Or, oh, when I'm in this hallway, I'm gonna go down the overlapping segment and I'm gonna go straight. So they were essentially playing out this trajectory in their minds to guide their future behavior. Well, we could use a circuit of head direction cells. We could have the, uh, I'm showing how I've modeled this. I have the behavioral input driving head direction cells that would drive the grid cells. The grid cells would drive place cells, and then we can code a particular trajectory by forming associations between the place cells and the associated head direction along that trajectory. In addition, we can form associations between the place cells and local views of the environment. This is kind of a 
a simple um, representation of what a rat might see in an open field environment, but it could involve items as well. And then during recollection, you have the, the system has the ability to start at a particular location and be cued by the cues at that location. Um, this shows the input during encoding, and this shows the output of the network during recollection. It's effectively retrieving individual spatial views from this retrieval of the episodic representation of that trajectory in the environment. So this was queued by a particular item. This is just showing that you can queue at different locations. So you can queue it um, with a particular item here and get the full trajectory, or you can queue it with a particular item here and just get a partial trajectory. Um, in the simulations, we're able to, to do overlapping trajectories, so we can have if we have two learned overlapping trajectories, here I cue it with an item represented by the plus sign, it'll go to the left, cue it with a star, and it'll go to the right. And so I'm essentially able to simulate the overlapping condition by using this circuit in, involving the hippocampus, and that could be why the hippocampus is more active in this overlapping condition. All right, so I've kind of gone, tried to bridge you across a lot of different levels. Um, talked about the grid cell code and mechanisms for the grid cell code, but then also tried to relate to that to how the grid cell code could be involved in spatial memory function in human episodic memory function. All right, thanks very much. Yeah, it's an electrical, yeah, sorry, it's an electrical chirp. So it's a, it's a current injection to the neuron that's oscillating slow frequencies, increasing in frequency. And then the second question is, do you, is there, has there been any research done on what happens grid cell-wise if you have creatures moving in the 3D environment? So that has been done, not in our lab, but Kate Jeffrey looked at this. And as, as I understand her results, they in general suggest that the grid cells are really coding two-dimensionally primarily. So in some cases, they've had rats running on a wall, and some cells seem to be just coding columns that are based on the two-dimensional location. But they've also had rats run on a spiral maze. And there is some evidence that play cells will fire more on one spiral. Were you doing these experiments as well? Um, anyway, they, they've shown that there's a, a, there is some coding of three dimensions by play cells. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's partly why the attractor dynamic models are kind of preferable because the hexagonal pattern seems to arise, you know, more naturally out of circularly symmetric connectivity. And it's been shown, there's a mathematical theorem showing that, you know, if you're packing circles into a space, the best way to lay them out is in a hexagon pattern. So that is, whereas in the oscillatory interference model, you have to essentially you know, create that hexagonal pattern. So, and I've shown in you know, an earlier paper, I've shown if you give head direction cell inputs at 90 degrees, you'll get a square grid. Or if you give them at 30, 30 degrees or 45 degrees, you'll get really weird patterns. So, so that is uh, an advantage of the attractor dynamic model in accounting for the data. But say in your head direction cell recordings, you haven't found evidence for some interesting non-uniformity in their preferred directions that could account for something like that. Yeah. So believe me, I've looked at that a lot. <laughs> um, if you look at some of the Moser lab data, it does sort of look like their, the head directions for adjacently recorded neurons are, are falling at like 60 degree angles. And the other thing we've seen, which we haven't really published, we sometimes see head direction cells that have multiple poles of selectivity. You maybe you've seen that. And, and is it in some of your published data? Anyway, so you'll, yeah, so you'll see cells, and the poles seem to be falling on average at about 60, 120 degrees, or at least, you know. And, and so part of the, pro part, the big problem is finding the right way to measure that statistically. You know, they, if you look through the data, it looks as if it's there, but we haven't yet published that. Um, so in your um, 
in the uh, model results where you had uh, just comparing the head direction or heading a particular direction to reach the target and looking to see if you overlap one of the goal play cells. Um, in more complex environments, would you expect that something else is being integrated, like uh, longer paths are being chosen, or that the goal cells are such that, uh, like they back propagate such that it's always just head direction, or you have longer paths that you're testing out in your head? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question, and it kind of leads into what we've been really focusing on in our recent research. I don't have any of the slides kind of queued up, but we've, one thing that we've done is to deal with this problem of, you know, the distance of the search and the fact that, you know, if you want to have the same duration or you want to keep the duration of the search short, you really should do it on different scales simultaneously, and that would fit with the different scales of the grid cells as well. Um, and so Murat Erdem in my lab has been doing this with sim simultaneous search, the same time period, but at different spatial scales. So, you know, one search is going maybe 50 centimeters and the other is going 500 centimeters simultaneously. And, and if the, you know, if there's no goal at the short distance, you, but you pick up one at the larger scale, maybe with larger place cells, then you would move in that general direction until you get into that localized area. And then you look more at the, sh the I mean, you're doing simultaneously searching all scales, but the shorter scale will then give you a result in that new location. And the shorter scales would take precedence over the larger scales. So that's one thing that you kind of touched on. The other thing is you need to deal with obstacles in the environment. And that we've done as well. So we have a paper in European Journal of Neuroscience showing this where you can put obstacles in the environment and there's another class of cells known as uh, boundary vector cells that will respond to obstacles in the environment that you could use as a way of, of, of coding them in this sort of network. Um, but this does require an extra feature that you can't, if you're trying to find, for instance, a shortcut through a set of obstacles, you can't find it just by doing these you know, linear searches. And so there we do have to go back to what I briefly touched on, which is this older technique of backward diffusion from the goal location. So you have to have enough place cells that there's some backward diffusion from the goal. And then when you find the forward trajectory that intersects with that backward diffusion, you select that direction of movement. So it's interesting, these issues that come up with, you know, as soon as you're trying to implement the, the actual goal-directed behavior. Um, I mean, it's not, it's consistent with the cognitive map sort of theory um, in this, or, you know, you can set it, you can assume that it's primarily, you know, based on cognitive mapping. I haven't re restricted myself that way in the sense that I haven't, you know, been as dogmatic as John O'Keefe or Lynn Nadell about the idea that you have primarily a spatial map. I agree more with Yuri that you have a, a big time component to it as well. Um, so, you know, and it, it, I mean, it's consistent with Tolman's initial idea of, you know, having an internal model of the environment, certainly, as opposed to, a, you know, stimulus response sort of re reaction. So this is all still within kind of Tolman's domain. But like I said, I don't really think of it as just being a, you know, a, a spatial map. You'd have some time component to it as well. Or you could even have you know, items. This kind of relates to the question about more complex environments. You, you could have topological maps rather than strictly you know, Euclidean spatial maps of the environment. And imagine you know, thinking your way through concepts rather than space. Chris, <laughs> I thought you were pointing at somebody. <laughs> um, so I'm uh, curious about the age current and its organization in environmental cortex. I mean, where does that come from? Are there any suggestions about developmentally why you happen to have that particular organization? Is it yeah. programmed or is it something that can be generated based on activity? Yeah, so I've thought a lot about that as well. And we've looked, there, there isn't any molecular data yet on it. The physiological data is quite robust. And like I said, it's been replicated. But uh, we were looking at the Allen Brain Atlas, trying to see you know, if HCN1 was showing different densities along the, the dorsal to ventral axis. And that hasn't yet been shown. Hopefully, somebody will look at that soon. Um, but there is, there is evidence. I mean, it, there is some precedence for topographic distributions of protein markers within structures. For instance, in the tectum, um, you have, you know, the, the kind of, or the superior colliculus, you have this um, visual kind of retinotopic map being set up, and that's being set up by actually a gradient of proteins that are 
called F proteins, EPH, that are distributed in gradients you know, along the anatomical axes of the tectum. And so there's a precedence for proteins being expressed in some smooth gradient that could be the case in the medial anterior cortex. Though it actually now looks like maybe it's not a, even a smooth gradient based on the Moser's recent data. It might be these quantal steps that there might be four steps of expression of the, the, sub, of the subunits. Nope. Yeah, I think it does. Um, I've actually wrote a commentary because they had this paper in Science, um, Calstrip et al., where they showed the corresponding difference in place cell size. And Yuri has a paper like that as well, showing that dorsal place cells are smaller and ventral place cells are, are larger. Um, and it does seem consistent with the topography of the anatomical con connectivity from dorsal and to, you know, dorsal to dorsal and or dorsal anterior to septal hippocampus and ventral anterior to temporal hippocampus. Um, but there's a lot of people who try to make a, quanti a qualitative distinction between the ventral hippocampus and the dorsal hippocampus, saying that ventral is more involved in things like fear conditioning. Um, but one, one potential approach to that apparent qualitative difference is that if you think about it, something like fear conditioning is usually done with you know, a context that's a, a, an entire environment. The animal's trained, oh, there's like a fearful stimulus in that entire environment, and then there's a different entire environment that's not fearful, whereas the tests of spatial memory are using a Morris water maze where there's a platform at one location that might be moved 40 centimeters to a different location, you know, so they, they're, there's, they're basically requiring the rat to distinguish things on the order of centimeters, whereas the fear conditioning tasks are usually requiring them to, to distinguish things on the level of meters. So you could argue that that distinction is arising from a difference in the spatial scale rather than you know, some qualitative difference. But there is, a, you know, that said, there is evidence that ventral hippocampus seems to have more connectivity with the amygdala, so it does have more access to these you know, fear pathways. OK, so um, with that, let me just remind you that uh, it's, you're on your own for lunch, as it were, uh, except for the speakers. Uh, until 1.30, so we're going to start right up at 1.30, and we'll have Michael Tarr talking to us about the underlying neuroscience of face recognition. Um, but let's thank Michael Hassanol once more for... Thanks.